is Diagnosis Glaucoma with your hosts, Dr. Mona Colleen and Dr. Harry Quigley. Hello, and thanks for joining us for this episode of Diagnosis Glaucoma. Today, we are going to be talking with Beth Glassman, who is going to speak to us about living with glaucoma. She is a patient and an advocate for glaucoma, and we're really excited to have her on the program. Up until now, you've pretty much just heard Harry and I talk to each other or other doctors, and we're really excited to finally bring in a patient's voice to our discussion. Beth, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, first of all, Dr. Kleem, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm truly honored. I'm a mother, a grandmother, and a glaucoma patient. I started my journey with glaucoma as a child. I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease when I was eight called uveitis. This required me to spend a lot of time at eye doctors. I started using drops, oral steroids, steroid injections, and I lost sight in one eye. And then as a young adult, I was diagnosed with glaucoma. Again, spent more time in eye doctor's offices using drops, oral steroids, steroidal injections, and then glaucoma procedures, laser diode procedures, and a tubal shunt. But quite honestly, one eye was not affected, and I went on with my life, and most people didn't even know I had an eye problem. I played tennis, I went off to college and graduate school, got married, raised my children, and carried on in my life as if nothing had happened. But about 15 years ago, I sustained a horrific accident to my good eye. I was accidentally hit. My eye broke open, and I lost the sight. And suddenly, my life was turned upside down, reliant on an eye I was never going to use. And that was my introduction to low vision. You know, over the years, I've actually learned a whole lot from you, Beth. Um, And I hope that in addition to other patients listening to this podcast episode that doctors will also listen to what you have to say. I'm really impressed with all of the things that you've done in terms of managing your lifestyle and modifications you've made to function better. And so there's like a whole list of things that we can talk about that affect daily living. What are the things that you think probably have made the greatest impact? And and we can start maybe with reading. You know, I was always a big reader, and losing the sight the way I did made reading difficult. But thank goodness for modern technology, because it's really saved the day. Audible is frankly my best friend. I'm able now to enjoy books the way I used to, and it's a thrill to really keep up with books. I'm actually not only in a book club, I chair a book club, so I'm not missing anything at all. The iPhone is also a great help with people with a small visual field. It's formatted perfectly. And if you go to general in your settings and accessibility, you can actually help yourself on the iPhone by increasing the font size or improving clarity. The people at Apple can help you with this, or a low vision technology expert can also format your phone to help you stay in touch and stay on top. So you do most of your reading on your phone and listen to books, but um, are there other ways that you read also? For example, do you recommend like an iPad or a kind of a tablet? Yes, I do use a tablet, but I find the iPhone with a small visual field is actually better. And just out of curiosity, I'm actually an Android user. Do you in particular recommend the iPhone? Do you find that the features are really good um, for those who have vision impairment? I find that Apple has been very helpful. If you make an appointment online, You can request someone who is specially trained in visual disability, and I find that to be a great help. That's really nice. With my Android phone, I have found that under settings, there is also the accessibility feature where people can go in and make changes to the contrast and the font and that sort of thing. I'm not too sure about the resources that go beyond that, but I have heard a lot about Apple and its great technology in helping with vision modifications and helping the visually impaired. I hear a lot of the occupational therapists and vision rehab doctors in particular reference Apple products. 
So how about accessibility in the home and also outside of the home? What can you tell people that you've done? Well, safety is truly very important. And outside the home, you know, our sidewalks are now strewn with bikes and scooters, which makes things hazardous. Curbs are hazardous. And if curb cutouts are not accompanied by tactile dots, someone with low vision doesn't know if they're safely on the sidewalk or in the street. So it is crucially important that you make your home a safe place. That is a place you can control. So some of the things that I would recommend, if you have stairs outside your home, put in a railing. Your stairs inside your home also need special attention. I painted the banister a color. I even put tape on the edge so I would see the step. If your home becomes burdensome for you, then it's really time to move. Move to a one-level apartment I did, and I found great relief in doing so. But even when you're in one level, you have to be neat and tidy. Don't keep things cluttered on the floor that may cause a trip hazard. Cords, such as the vacuum cleaner cord, should never be left open. Doors should be closed, cabinets closed, dishwashers closed. And you really need to get the people you live with to think about your safety. You had mentioned the tape and the railing. May I ask, is there any particular color tape that you recommend and where can people get this type of tape? Yellow, and I am a big Amazon user, so I just order everything on Amazon, but certainly a hardware store too. And just out of curiosity, because I've done some uh, research in this area, do you find that blue is also helpful or? Yes, blue is also helpful. Blue is also helpful. There is also tape that has a texture, and I've also used that. I have actually seen tape like that at hardware stores. So maybe for those of you who don't use online purchasing like Amazon and you want to go to the store, uh, I would recommend probably checking out uh, one of the hardware stores. Let's move on to maybe personal care and beauty and hygiene. You know, just because you're visually impaired or you lose your sight, You still have self-esteem and dignity, and everyone should try to look their best. So I have a problem in that I can't see my face in the mirror. So I made an appointment with a makeup artist to teach me how to apply makeup when I can't see myself. I will tell you less is more in this case, but I did learn how to apply makeup, and I feel better knowing that I look my best. And may I ask, what kinds of things were recommended for you? Using your hands to feel your cheekbones. I also learned about the secret of powder in between foundation. So, you know, there are lots of things that beauty tricks, eyebrow touch-ups, those sort of things that help accentuate your eyes, but without using eye makeup. And are there certain types of mirrors that you use? You know, I have a mirror that has, it's a natural light and I use that. But quite honestly, light that comes directly into your face is really not good for you. It blinds. It's blinding. So it's best to just use overhead lighting if possible. And in terms of like your clothing, how do you recommend organizing your clothes at home, but also just finding the clothes that you're going to wear every day and making sure that you're coordinated? This is something that's very important to me. So actually, when I buy clothes, I buy a complete outfit. So I will buy a sweater to go with a pair of pants. I'll buy a blouse to go with a skirt. And frequently, I'll get the phone number of the salesperson. And when I get home, I will take pictures of some scarves that I might use as accessories to ask for advice. And that seems to be very helpful. Are there certain colors that you prefer to wear because you can see them better? I I try to keep to solids. I think that is more important than anything else. And then to use a scarf because the solids will coordinate easily. And how do you organize your clothes at home also so that it's easy for you to pick them out? Labeling is key here. I do hang tags on the hangers and the hang tags coordinate with pants. So gray, black, brown, navy. Each pair of pants goes on a tag 
And when the pants go out to the cleaners, that hanger remains vacant until those pants come back. So I am not confused. I also label my shoes so I can keep track of what color shoes I'm wearing as well as the pants. You mentioned hang tags. Are they of particular textures or colors? No, you know, frankly, I just type it out in large font and scotch tape it on. It's easy. It's a little bit time consuming, but I feel good that I can get dressed without having to ask anyone, what color is this? Does this go with that? I feel comfortable and confident when I get dressed. And are there certain organizational tools that you recommend for the closet? Like, for example, is there like a certain product you like, maybe certain hangers or certain shelves? No, I think that organization is key when you lose your sight and just keeping things tidy and space in between um, is helpful. I group colors together and separate spring, summer from fall, winter. So what I'm hearing from you is a lot of the importance on keeping things organized and well-labeled, basically. Yes. Labeling is also very important for medicine both drops and pills. So as soon as I get home from the drugstore, I make labels for the eye drops and for pills. I can't read any of them, and I can't tell one dropper from another. It's hard enough to remember your drops, let alone getting confused which drop you use. So I think it's crucially important to take the time to label your medicine. And do you use any particular devices for the labeling? Like, for example, I've seen pill boxes that can talk to you and pillboxes that have a clock on them so you know what time you're supposed to take them because the alarm goes off. Have you seen anything like that, Beth? I've never seen anything like that. No, I, I guess I do it the old-fashioned way. You know, I've been taking drops for 50 years, so I'm a veteran at this, but I keep a piece of paper next to my bed, and I check off when I take my drops. I also cluster the drops around mealtimes. So if you take drops twice a day breakfast, dinner, breakfast, bedtime. If you take drops four times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime. It's just important that you take it. And the difference between drops and pills, you know, at the end of the day, you look into your pill box, oh my, there's a pill left. Not so with drops. It's so easy to forget. We get so busy during the day. So keeping a piece of paper and checking it off is the best way to go. Yeah, I I think that's a great way which you're recommending with the checkbox. It really holds you accountable also to using your medications. And other things that I've heard people doing are there are some patients who actually take tape and label their bottle droppers or their medications in some way so that when they touch it, they know what the difference is between, you know, the different eye drops that they have to use. Again, like the use of audio. So people who can get something that where they touch, they touch the, the bottle or they touch their pillbox, it talks to them and it tells them what that medication is. But I've really been really fascinated with the use of tactile sensation to know what your medications are. Also, I wanted to talk to you about dining out and especially like lighting, because you and I have talked quite a bit about that. How do you manage dining out? First of all, once again, technology is our friend. I cannot read a menu in a restaurant, so I will look up the menu before I go. When I make a reservation, I will ask for a well-lit table. But there have been times where I've taken a light with me to put on the table. I don't know what it is with restaurants. They think it's chic to have a dark environment. I can't see a darn thing. So having the extra light really helps me. Another trick that I've learned is I have started to ask that all my salads be chopped. Lettuce is really tricky to cut. When I cut it, it's all over the table. It's, it's really embarrassing. And you know, my friends are now asking for their salads to be cut. It really makes eating a salad much more enjoyable. I never thought about that. That's, that's a great tip. And you're not the only one who has a hard time reading menus in restaurants. I struggle with that also. I feel like restaurants are getting dimmer and dimmer. I also sometimes will just simply take out my phone and use the lighting on my phone to read a menu. And it's, again, great that we have phones and tablets. Because as you said, you can look at a menu beforehand and even take that phone or tablet with you to the restaurants. A lot of restaurants these days during COVID times, wants you to scan their menu with a QR code. 
that's actually kind of a nice thing because when you scan it, you're taking a picture or going directly to their website and then you can just simply use your fingers tips to just increase the size of the thing that you're looking at, of the menu or the website. So I find that to actually be very nice. And let's talk also a little bit more about lighting because that's a very big problem, not just when we're dining out, but just generally when we're at home or, you know, really anywhere. How have you managed improving or increasing the lighting? I can never have enough light. I have recessed lights. I always make sure I have adequate reading light when I'm doing any sort of work. But as I said, never have a light face you. It just is absolutely blinding. But light is your friend, and in any way you can use it, it's important. Daylight is important as well. You bring up an important point about glare and having the right kind of lighting. Um, so how do you manage to have the right amount of light but not glare? You know, glare is really something that glaucoma patients deal with, but a lot of people deal with glare. So glare comes into our home, and I can tell you white walls are not your friend. It just bounces everywhere. So use a wall color that would absorb the glare. I find that I've started wearing visors when I go outside. I hate hats, but they really help. And so I wear a visor summer and winter when I go for a walk. I wear a big brimmed hat when I'm outside in the summer. And that really helps too. I think that people also find relief with tinted glasses. And that's something that you should do in consultation with the low vision specialist. There are different colored tints that you need to try out that you yourself will see what works for you. But that can be a big help. I've also seen that too. Um, the yellow or the plum tinting in particular have been very helpful. Yes. For those who don't get a chance to go to a vision rehab specialist, you can actually just buy those glasses online or you can go to a hardware store and pick them up. The yellow tinting in particular, I've seen quite a few patients wearing those to try to brighten things, but also to reduce glare. And if you're out driving, the glare can bother anyone, you know, someone who has no vision problems. In addition, of course, people who have glaucoma and other eye conditions. So just wearing sunglasses with UVA and UVB protection are great. The use of visors in the car to block light. You can actually get extra visors to attach to the ones that are already in your car to help block out some of that extra glare that you don't need that can really make it hard for you to be driving. Another really big topic that I'm a big advocate for is increasing contrast in your home or in your environment. You and I have talked about how you've done that quite a bit. What are some tips that you can give to our listeners about improving the contrast? I always tell the story of waking up in the morning, going to brush your teeth, you take the white cap off the toothpaste, you put it on the white counter, you go to retrieve the cap and it falls on the floor. Of course, the floor is white and you're on your hands and knees trying to find the top. And that's how you start your day. Very, very frustrating. And there are some really easy things you can do to help yourself. First of all, just with the white cap, if you had a colored washcloth, navy, gray, doesn't make any difference. The contrast would enable you to find that white cap. One thing I did in the kitchen, of course, is a very important area. I gave away all my mugs and I bought white mugs. Now I don't burn myself when I have coffee. Outlets are very difficult for me to find, so I bought bumps to place around the outlets and now I can plug in a coffee pot. I use those bumps on the oven at 350, the washing machine, so they come in, you know, they come in handy. I also have a dark and light cutting board. So you certainly don't want to be cutting an onion on a white cutting board. You would choose your dark cutting board. If you're cutting bread, you want to have, always have that contrast. I also tell people about keeping brightly colored rugs in their home and actually wearing brightly colored shoes. A lot of places you go, they have these like nice, perfect, white looking floors. And you know, you're walking around with like a light pair of shoes, light color pair of shoes, and it can make it really hard to see. In the home, the bathroom is a place where a lot of people have falls and injuries. And you know, if you just use like brightly colored rugs in the bathroom 
right where the sink is, where the toilet is. It can really make a big difference. Other things that I have seen are, as you mentioned before, the tape, the use of tape, the yellow and the blue just to outline certain things. And at medical centers and a lot of public spaces, we try to do that also where we have high contrast to demarcate where things are, like a parking garage or maybe a button for a elevator or something like that. One thing that I advocate against is the use of a lot of glass in the home because people can easily walk into glass if they're disturbed by the glare. And again, like really that lack of contrast. Glass certainly looks really nice, like a glass dining table, but it's not very functional. Very dangerous. It is so dangerous because you won't see the edges. A glass coffee table is just a big no-no. Yeah. I I mean, I, I really feel like things should be more functional. We have to take into account the functionality of things in our home and in our environments. The other thing we should talk about is how to manage blurred vision and changes in your peripheral vision. I remember the day when I noticed I had peripheral vision loss. I was driving my teenage son and suddenly his hand appeared out of nowhere. He was reaching across to change the radio and I literally jumped. So I have peripheral vision loss to the right. And it means that I can't see anything to the right, and I'm constantly knocking over glasses to my right. Once again, there's no contrast. The glass doesn't exist. The crystal glass at the restaurant doesn't exist for me. So I'm, I move those glasses in front of me and gain control so that I can see them. I also tend, if I'm in a booth, I will sit all the way in to the right, so the blind side to the wall, so then I can see my guests, the waiter, et cetera, when they come to the table. Blurry vision is another problem. I have become very good at listening to people's voices and recognizing them. I know everyone's hairstyle. I know their gait. But honestly, It's really better to share your disability with your friends. Let them know. Instead of being a super sleuth, it takes so much effort to do that. My friends come up to me and they introduce themselves. And these are my best friends. And they know that I can't see their faces. So it's really helpful. Just be easy on yourself. Let others help you. And last subject that we should touch on, which is very important, is eye discomfort. What can you share with us in terms of how to manage eye discomfort? I find that I have the most eye discomfort at the end of the day. I think your eyes get tired and gritty. A warm washcloth will help relieve that. And frankly, sometimes just laying down and closing your eyes, it's a good time to listen to a book or listen to music. And that's the best trick I can give you. And Beth, what can you tell us about navigating an unfamiliar space? It is a real challenge to go somewhere for the first time. But get your courage up and do it. Don't stay isolated at home. You miss out and we miss out on being with you. So I have a protocol when I travel and that's really the most difficult, going to a hotel that you don't know. So after going through a train station or airport, You go to a hotel, and this is what I do. I ask someone from the hotel to come up with me when I check into the room. I find the bed, and I ask the person to show me where is the outlet so I know where to plug in my phone. Sitting on the bed, I will ask where the closet is, and I will go to the closet, look inside. Usually I find the safe. I carry a light with me, and I'll put the light in there. I go back to the bed and ask the person to escort me to the bathroom. There again, I will ask to be shown how to operate the tub or the shower, and I always ask for a mat to go inside, a rubber-proof mat. I go back to the bed, and then I ask for instructions on the heat and air conditioning, which is always very teeny-weeny, and then I will ask for instructions on lights. I always keep on a light to take me to the restroom in the middle of the night. I now have the entire room has been laid out to me. And quite honestly, I'm exhausted. And so whenever I travel, 
I schedule nap time. I don't go anywhere. I lay down, no joke, for two hours. And that allows me to rest and recuperate and then go out to dinner. So no matter what I do, I build in time to handle this kind of trip. And then I don't have the fear because I know I don't have to perform right away, but I will understand my surroundings completely. And Beth, you had once mentioned to me about when you're going to go to like someone's house for the first time or a new restaurant to kind of like pre-plan that. So how do you do that? I do a drive-by. So I will see how many steps there are at a new restaurant or at someone's home. That may tell me I should wear flats, not heels. May tell me I'm going to need extra light to get up the stairs or down the stairs when I leave in the evening. Down is always harder than going up because you don't have a riser there to guide you. I'll see if there's a railing. So I'll know what I'm heading into and I'm not blind. How do you also manage exercise? Because I know that you're very active. Well, thank you for that. Exercise is important for everybody. And even if you have vision loss, you still need to exercise. But you need to think about your exercise carefully. So I no longer use a treadmill or an elliptical for fear of falling off. So I have a stationary bike, not a Peloton, just a standard stationary bike. And I am very joyous in riding the bike. I was always a big walker, but the streets are unsafe for me now. So just recently, I found a track near my house, and I put in my AirPods and I walk. I guess this story is to tell you, figure out what you need to do in order to get your exercising in. I faced one obstacle after another, but I overcame it. Being healthy and getting exercise is important to do for yourself. Very true. I wanted to point out some earlier podcasts that we've had this year with our chief, Dr. Pradeep Ramalu where he actually talks about his research with glaucoma patients and exercise and how exercise is really good for our glaucoma and our overall health. So it's really important to continue to stay as active as you possibly can. Some things that I wanted to mention, because I've grown up my whole life with people who have vision impairment from various things, and to touch on many of the points that you made about making things brighter and bigger and really maximizing contrast and using a lot of labeling and audio. I can just point out a couple things that my father has done. He loves to drive, but he was having a hard time with his peripheral vision. And so he actually got some extra mirrors put on his car so that he could see things coming from different angles better. And he worked with someone in driving rehab to help him to angle those mirrors so that they were more effective and added things in the car on the visors so that it would block out all the glare. And something really inventive that my mom came up with was also, as you had mentioned, Beth, the use of yellow tape. And in our garage, we actually have glow-in-the-dark paint so that when my dad goes in and out of the garage, he can see that yellow glow-in-the-dark paint at night and thankfully not have any, any accidents hitting the poles or the side mirrors against the garage or anything like that. And other things, for example, a lot of the magnifiers, as you have magnifiers I know at home, he keeps a lot of magnifiers at home and on his phone. He uses a magnification app with lighting. And most people actually have that on their phones. I know I have that with the Android system. I'm pretty sure iPhone has that as well. Other things that he does, which I think might help some of the listeners here, are really just to, you know, try to use audio. So listening to audio resources, YouTube is great. And Beth, as you mentioned, Audible is a great way to stay on top of your reading list. Again, I I really find everything that you do to be very inspirational. And I've learned so much from you. In terms of our listeners, what are some resources that have helped you the most that you might recommend to them? Well, thank you, Dr. Kleem. I think that low vision rehabilitation is the way to go. You have technicians there that understand vision loss and they can help you navigate when you lose your sight. They can help with mobility, technological support, and independent living skills. It's a service you don't need a referral 
Medicare pays for it. And it has been invaluable to me, and I would highly recommend it. Great point. Vision Rehabilitation is a fantastic resource. For those of you who don't know about Vision Rehabilitation or where to find one, you can just go to Google and type in Vision Rehabilitation, or you can simply just ask your eye doctor. Usually the eye doctors are tuned in to where they can send you for an evaluation. There are even some places that will do home visits. So they come to your home or to your workplace and do like an entire evaluation with you, which is really nice. And there are also ways that you can get transportation set up to take you to a vision rehabilitation center. Beth, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners? I think that they've really learned a lot by listening to you today. Oh, I hope so. Treasure your sight. Everyone should get an eye exam once a year. If you have glaucoma, be compliant, take your drops, go for your checkups, keep a healthy lifestyle and get exercise. And if you have vision loss, then call the rehabilitation service. Losing sight is difficult and hard, but you don't have to do it alone. And with guidance, you can really have a full and very complete life. Thank you so much for joining us on the program, Beth, and we look forward to learning more from you as time goes on. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaleem. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, your mom says take your drops. 